We're back with Vivek Sidera of Superhuman to dive into everything from his habits and routines to the tools he loves, his favorite books, and more, all in less than 20 minutes. This is 20 Minutes and 10 Questions with Vivek Sidera. Let's get started. Vivek, I'm super excited to have you back to run through these 10 questions that we ask every guest. Thank you so much for the extra time. Thank you. So the first question is a little selfish. I mean, one of my favorite things that I've heard you talk about is some of what you look for in founders and founding teams. And some of that's obviously based on your background. Some of that's the kind of lenses that you put on as an investor. Some of the things that you've said in the past is like, when you're thinking about founders, asking yourself the question, is this what this person was meant to do in the world? And looking for things that, you know, founders that are controlling, looking for founder problem fit. So I'd love to hear you just to kind of expand from there on other things that you look for as an investor in founders, founding teams, and just the approach you take there. Yeah. So when I talked about control, it was less about controlling and more about they would not outsource or delegate some of the early work to others that they would own the initial work in the beginning and make sure that the product, the company, the user experience, whatever it may be, is molded in their fashion. Because I think it's very easy recruiting, for example, to offload recruiting to a third-party agency. But I don't think you would actually build the right team in that effort. It's important that the founding team own that particular approach. So for me, I do look for, just from my own experience, from being a student of tech and also now from an investing lens where I'm a pre-seed seed seed and series A investor, and I have my own small fund on the side, where I look for founders and founding teams that, as I mentioned, have a technical background, have product chops, have strong founder market fit. I should get a sense that they were meant to do this better than anyone else on the planet. Like if Rahul came to me and was like, I want to build a self-driving car company, I'd be like, I don't see strong founder market fit there. But if Kyle from Cruise, he has strong founder market fit, he's best suited to do this better than anyone else. So I really look for that. I get turned off when I come across founders, especially first-time founders who don't have a mental model and don't understand what it takes to build a company, that then they are just trying to find a problem to solve like they've gone through six different iterations and they're like, I'm going to try to solve this problem. And it's like, no, the problem should be so near and dear to your heart that you're like, I have to do this. I obsess and I breathe this. The other things I look for are, does this person have a chip on their shoulder? What really drives them to do this beyond just like the idea of starting a company and solving a customer issue? Like there's something that has to be more there. It might be that they experienced this pain point so deeply in a previous company, or you know, if they're doing like a healthcare company and maybe their parents experienced health issues while they were growing up. So something along those lines. I also look for, does this person have a particular secret about the world and understand something that I don't know and that a lot of other people don't know? So for example, with Superhuman, Rahul had this idea around having this keyboard-centric command line interface experience that didn't have all the Gmail extension bells and whistles that was rooted in speed and search. And I did not agree with that in the beginning, but I was like, look, you're owning product and you're driving this. But he was right. He was absolutely right. He understood that the next great productivity companies are going to be the ones that help people get time back, that focus on speed, that reduce people's anxieties, and so forth. And I do look for that when I come across founding teams where I'll dig in and I'll dig in, I'll dig in, and I'll learn something that I didn't realize or I didn't know before. I'm a big believer that a startup at the end of the day is a series of experiments to unlock some type of learning or user psychology. And you kind of have to go through this experience of starting a company and iterating and trying to see what works. And then you unlock this. And I've been fortunate enough to see that with some of the recent companies I've invested in where I'm like, okay, you understand this unique thing that like not very many other people understand. That's going to give you a competitive advantage and allow you to build a moat around that. I love your perspective there. I'd love to now take the lens, kind of focus it on yourself. And there are really two questions that we ask everybody. And the first one, which is going to relate a lot to superhuman, is what are your superpowers? When you kind of look at yourself, think about yourself, 
what are some of your biggest strengths? I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room. I think I'm pretty hardworking. I don't think I'm the strongest or the best looking, but I would say that I pride myself on being able to identify winners and being able to identify people who are special. So when I met Rahul back in 2010, from our first encounter, I knew he was incredibly special and this was someone I wanted to work with at some point in my career. And so I've been fortunate enough to have that experience and to be really refined over time and to identify, like finding Amuye, initially our iOS lead, who's now head of all engineering at Superhuman. I met her within the first five minutes. I was like, oh, she's special. <laughs> we need to bring her on the team. And we moved mountains, even though she had offers on the table and she was going to make a decision in like three days. I ran back and I like moved mountains for us to kind of like super expedite the process. And we came in and we beat out everyone else. And so whether it's teams of companies, whether it's individuals, that's something I do pride myself in. Another superpower is I like to predict the future and I pull in a lot of discrete and non-discrete data from my own experience studying a particular industry, looking at tangential industries, kind of like what's going on, and then try to map out what the future looks like. And so it's really eerie to see Superhuman where we are today like, for example, when we raised our seed round, I had told Rahul, and I don't remember saying this, but I told him specifically, this was prior to, to actually raising the seed round. We were just starting the process. I told him specifically, we need to raise from first round for our seed, and we need to raise from Andreessen Horowitz for either like our series A or series B. And I was very adamant about that. And I was like, this is what feels right. And this is kind of like where I see us going. And then first round came in as the very last investor in our seed round and we end up closing them and they ultimately led, they put in the lion's share of our seed. And then fast forward, A16Z led our B and Rahul reminded me of this conversation. He was like, do you remember saying that? I was like, vaguely. He's like, yeah, it's kind of eerie how you were kind of like picking this out. And it's just, a lot of it's just like, there's a certain intuition feeling I have, which I'm still trying to deconstruct and turn into data beyond just like feeling an intuition. I'm like, how can I bubble this up and actually turn this into something that's more tangible beyond just a feeling? And then I would say the third is really around relationship building. I really pride myself on building relationships with people internally in the company, external to the company, with just people in general. I'm fortunate to be where I'm at professionally, personally, through all these relationships, many of them turned into friendships. Over the past 15 years, I am very prideful and I very much value the Rolodex I've built, this network that I've built. I do enjoy people at the end of the day. I think people are the most complex systems and they're the most complex puzzles. Like forget trying to debug some code, like trying to like really understand people. It's a really interesting exercise. It kind of gets me really excited. Like what makes this person tick? What are their motivations? What are their wants and needs? And then through that exploration and understanding, as I'm like building this relationship, I do start to build a connection with that particular individual. And I'm fortunate to have a lot of really close people in my life and an extended network as a result. Love those answers. On the flip side, and we've talked about this a little bit, but what have you struggled with professionally, personally, and how have you gotten better at those things over time? My health. It's everything from sleep to mindfulness to even like the process of losing weight. I'm trying to eat better. I'm trying to like work out. It's really challenging to do all these things consistently when you're in a startup environment Monday through Friday, and then you angel invest over the weekends. And it's just, it's challenging to have consistency because there's constantly something that comes up and you have to derail your plans of getting up at 6 a.m. and then getting on the Peloton and then taking a swim and then meditating. And it's like, nope, I have to stay up quite late the night before, so I can't do that. So that gets thrown out the window. So what's been helpful, honestly, having an accountability partner, my wife, has probably been the biggest help is she would just kind of be like, hey, you shouldn't eat after nine o'clock and go to sleep. And last night she was like, I'm going to make sure you are tucked into bed by 10 o'clock. <laughs> None of this like staying up late, et cetera. 
because it cascades and it just kind of like you might get a short term fix, but it has long term negative effects. And at this point in my life, I'm trying to optimize more for long term versus just the short term. And it's just challenging to kind of balance that or like short term needs and not letting like my health suffer. I see my life as an equilateral triangle where the points represent wealth, health, and social. And so I've indexed, ideally, it's a full equilateral triangle that isn't disproportionate in one area or the other, but I've indexed so much on the social and wealth. And by wealth, I mean like work, professional aspects, and then social friendships and family and whatnot that I've let my health suffer. And so if I could go back in time, I would absolutely invest in fitness. Like Justin Kahn has the saying, fitness is the first step to greatness. I would have absolutely invested in that and absolutely invest in my mental health and wellness around that. So those are definitely the main things that I struggle with the most. I mean, I can relate. I can't list the number of days where it's like I have plans to go do X or Y or go work out at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. And it's, of course, the meeting or the email or whatever needs to happen is always a push and pull there. The next questions that we ask are just around kind of areas of your life. And these may be things that resonate for you and these may not. But I think one of the first ones is just habits and routines. I think like the common way people kind of think about that is like, what is my playbook for the day? And that's certainly one aspect. I think the other aspect would just be like, I try to do these things and I try to kind of have this bar for myself most of the time. Yeah. I also am guilty of having these playbooks for the day, aspirationally getting in time to work out, getting in time to meditate in the mornings, and then just sprinting throughout the day trying to be disciplined around having a hard cutoff. My wife and I, we don't have kids yet. We will soon. And I've talked to peers who are fellow founders who have families. I'm like, how do you do this? Like, how do you have a baby and you're the founder, CEO of this company? Because a startup is a baby in itself. So you're kind of juggling two babies. Like, how do you do this? And ruthless prioritization and just say no, no, no. And so I've had to do that now where I get a, like quite a bit of inbound requests to chat about things from folks I don't know. And I have to say no a lot. I'm like, sorry, nope, nope, nope. Or if it's from an investing standpoint, I'm like, I exclusively keep my Mondays and Fridays for Superhuman. If you want to chat, let's chat on Saturday. I have this kind of time block available. And so that's been helpful just to have those aspects of my life segmented so I can laser focus. I did mention from like a routine standpoint, therapy is helpful. My wife and I go through couples therapy as well. So we see a couples therapist every couple of weeks. And that's been so immensely valuable. And I mentioned learning these habits around communication in the context of a romantic relationship can also be used in a professional context. Using I feel statements and not going over the net and all these things I've learned that I've applied and I've tried to push internally within the superhuman executive staff group. And so we have a cadence around that where we meet with our couples therapists and I I learn something new about myself every session. And I'm just like, okay, I need to get better at this or I didn't know that this was important to me. And I think that makes me a better founder, a better entrepreneur is just having that level of self-awareness. But that needs to be hard-coded. It can't just be like something you do once and then maybe you do it again like a couple years later, like being intentional about it and putting that on your calendar. Those things have a decay curve. (laughs) You have to make sure to kind of sequence them. That's right. Yeah. (laughs) So that's definitely part of my routine as well. In addition to like the aspirational aspects around improving my health and kind of getting into a particular rhythm. On the tool side, and this can be physical tools, digital tools, it can just be anything from, I recently bought this thing, I love it, or here's an app that's not superhuman, or superhuman's totally okay, (laughs) that you use day in and day out, but any tools you rely on that you just think are incredible? Yeah, so I rely on, from a physical product standpoint, with respect to my health, I rely on my Fitbit, and I rely on levels. So it's really interesting just learnings I get from, oh, wow, when I had two slices of watermelon, my glucose levels kind of spiked and that contributed to my sleep issues that night. And just kind of drawing this correlation, this analysis. Levels has been really eye-opening. It's something that I'm a happy paying customer of. Fitbit, it's just having 
something that's just a constantly I can check to see what my activity levels have been. And it's just a reminder to like push myself to be better there with software. For me, of course, superhuman It's number one. I probably live in my inbox at least four or five hours a day. When it comes to note-taking, I use a tool called mem.ai. This is a company I wish I invested in. They had raised their seed, I think, from Andreessen Horowitz. But it's probably the best note-taking experience I've come across. If you're not part of the Rome or Obsidian religion or cults there, it's replaced my Evernote and whatnot. With project and task management, I use Trello pretty religiously. That's been immensely valuable. I still haven't found a good tool for calendaring. I've explored every single one of them in the market, and I'm still waiting, A, from the standpoint of a user, and B, from the standpoint of an investor. And then I started using Reader by Readwise, and it's like the superhuman for Pocket or superhuman for Instapaper. And I love that product. And full disclosure, I'm an investor in the company. The founder is a former superhuman engineer. And so I just think like that's going to be the next billion dollar plus company and just kind of owning all things reading. But that's been a huge boon to my productivity and information consumption is using a product like that. Those are some great ones. Last question kind of in this vein would be around people. And these can be modern or historical figures, but just any person in particular or people in particular that have had an impact on you. And that can be being inspired by their stories. That can be just people like Justin Kahn that you follow today. Anything in that vein? Historical figure is MLK. I studied civil rights, MLK, Malcolm X, et cetera, growing up. And there's a Martin Luther King quote. It's my all-time favorite quote. The ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. I think that's what the quote is. And anytime I experience some discomfort or I experience some challenge or controversy, I think about that quote. And it's just this extra push of like, okay, like I am not going to grow if I'm comfortable. One rarely grows in comfort. One grows in discomfort. Because if you're in a box and that the boundary condition of the box serves as where you're comfortable, you're just going to be confined to that box. But if you want to keep growing and kind of want to grow that box, you have to step out, literally step outside your comfort zone. And so it's a reminder that when I'm experiencing something this is an opportunity for growth. This is an opportunity for me to level up in a particular area. And MLK had to deal with so much of that uh, as part of the civil rights movement. And then from a modern figure standpoint, I think for, for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's someone like Elon Musk, where I'm just like, I don't know how he does the things that he does and how he moves mountains the way that he does. And he does this with multiple companies all at the same time. I think he is the greatest entrepreneur of our generation. And I think he's going to have the most impact of any modern figure that I can think of. And it's like someone that like, I don't put people on pedestals, but like, this is someone that like, I absolutely do. To your point earlier, it's special, something special there. <laughs> Similarly, around books, any books that either you find yourself wanting to go back and reread often, you find yourself recommending to others often, and this can be in any vein. It can be whether it's professional or not. A few books come to mind. One is Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. I am naturally introverted. And when I was starting to work on my first company, I realized I had to become more extroverted in order to be successful professionally, but also with respect to the companies that I was doing. And so there are a lot of really basic principles and concepts in how to win friends and influence people that I remember reading at the time. And it's like, oh yeah, smile or say someone's name and just like remember their name or like all these different things. That's just so trivial when you read it, but it's definitely has significant impact. And it's definitely allowed me to become more of a relationship builder over time. Another book that I read, if How to Win Friends and Influence People is my favorite book, the book that's probably had the most impact on me is 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Now, there are folks who view that as like the psychopath's Bible. For me, I read these laws and 
they give examples in history. It's actually a really good book to read from a history point of view because Robert Greene goes in depth in terms of a historical figure like Otto von Bismarck. This is an example of a transgression of this law or the opposite. And things that I've learned, like one of the laws is don't outshine the master. And I, I try to outshine my co-founder of my first company many times. And I look back at my behavior. I'm like, what was I doing? That wasn't the right thing. And so now with Superhuman, Rahul is the CEO. Like, I'm not going to outshine him. I'm never going to outshine him. I'm going to try to propel him as much as possible. And these were kind of like things that I've learned as a result of reading this book. But at the same time, I've also have been more acutely aware of the various sharks that swim in the ocean with us. And people who really adhere to these laws, I can identify and see what they're doing. Even if they don't know the laws, but they're using them. Yeah, exactly. Like they might not be able to speak to exactly what they're doing from the lens of this particular chapter in this book, but it's an unfortunate reality that there are a lot of psychopathic type people and sociopathic people in tech and in the professional world. And I think it's important to identify who these people are. And I was incredibly naive when I was doing my first company. And I was a guppy swimming in the ocean. And I learned the hard way that there were certain people that did not operate like how I operated. And they were sharks. And I aspired to be a whale um, using that analogy and that metaphor. And so that book has definitely opened up my eyes. And so whenever I work with founders who are starting in their career, like, hey, you're going to be interfacing with a lot of investors. You're going to be interfacing with VCs. You're going to interface with these types of people. I recommend just like immerse yourself in this, but don't let this become your Bible. Just be aware that this exists. And then the third book, which I recommend to every founder is The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. This is sort of a bit of a Bible for superhuman and how we scale the company. There's a lot of really interesting content and learnings and best practices and principles around organizational health, the right leadership team, investing in your core values. In fact, we as a leadership group read the book, The Advantage. We referenced The Advantage as well as Patrick Lencioni's other book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, all the time. And there was a particular chapter around core values. And we took that to heart. And we ended up refactoring Superhuman's values. We had a set of six values when we first started the company. Fast forward a couple of years later, we read this chapter, we read this book. And we decided to completely refactor. And we came up with these three core values that serve as the operating conditions for the company. Create delight, be intentional, and remarkable quality. And that came out of the exercise in The Advantage. Highly recommend that book. Love those. Yeah. Your core values in a company, it's essentially what you would do almost to a fault. What your company does better than 99% of other companies. And it's true to the DNA of the core team. We actually blogged about it. I don't know if this is something that you can link to in the notes. Oh yeah, we can link to that in the show notes, yep. Hearing you describe the 48 Laws of Power is such a good example of like, I know that book, I've never felt compelled to read it, now I'm actually interested in reading it. (laughs) So thanks for that tee up and and the advantage, those are going to be books I'm ordering after this. So we ask every guest the same two closing questions, and I'm really excited to hear your answers for these. And the first one is if they're able to share a favorite failure. So something that obviously from the outside looking in probably felt like a terrible failure, you don't view that way for whatever reason. Yeah. I think we touched upon this a few times. So I would say my favorite failure is a failure of my own startup. I learned so much about myself in such a short amount of time, and it's at the time was incredibly painful, but... I am where I am today because of that. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. And then the last question is, what is your definition of success in whatever direction you want to take that question? I don't believe success is a function of vanity metrics, like how much money you make or income or anything financial for me, at least. And so success to me is what correlates with your happiness. And so There are folks who they are just genuinely happy creating art. And those people are successful using whatever their definition of happiness is. If they are at home or wherever they're at and creating art and they're creating these like art installation pieces, I think that person is successful. And then I think about success in the context of 
impact to the rest of the world. And so for myself, I would consider myself successful if I look back in my life, if I had significant impact, if I positively impact and change people's lives for the better. This is why I love the productivity space and this is why I love what we're doing as Superhuman is it's not just rebuilding email, but we're giving people time back and we're helping people, whether it's a few hours a week or whatever it may be, spend that time with their family or catching up on sleep or doing more work. And time is the most expensive resource. We can't buy time back. But what we can do is try to save as much time in whatever activities that are important for us. So I look at that as like, I think I am successful just purely looking at the number of customers we've had and all the anecdotes and feedback we receive from people where they're like, I love this product. You saved me so much time. I'm able to do this now. Thank you so much. That's success to me. Not evaluation, not having a particular exit event with Superhuman. In fact, Rahul asked me, he's like, how would you feel? This is the early days when we were just starting Superhuman. How would you feel if a Google or a Microsoft or a LinkedIn wanted to buy us for, let's say, like 300, 400 million, whatever it may be? And I was like, you and I both been there, done that. This is like a once in a generation type company that we have an opportunity to build. Let's really swing for the fences here. Because I think we can actually impact tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people's lives in what we're trying to do here. And you can do it in a bigger way if you stay independent, or you can do it on your own terms if you stay independent and adhere closely to your values. This has been incredible. Thank you again so much for the time, Vivek. This has been one of my favorite interviews in a while. Wow. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. For more from Vivek, listen to our long-form conversation all about co-founding Superhuman and his lessons learned as a repeat co-founder in episode 46. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 46. At our website, you can also find more incredible interviews with guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, and the founders of Titan Rally, Primal Kitchen, and other incredible companies. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.